So Felix, can you hear me? Yes, uh, right. So everybody can in principle unmute themselves, uh, but I would ask everybody to mute while the videos are going on and, um, and, and post your questions in the chat. But then, you know, if, if, if it works out well, I, I think it would be nice to also uh, repeat the session, uh, the, the question in person. So I'll ask people say, let's say Divesh, uh, why don't you ask your question in person? I think that's nicer. That's simulating simulating a, a, a presence uh, as best as possible. Right. But for the main, while the speakers are talking, I'll mute myself and stop exactly. my video. All right. Felix, you're welcome to keep your video as a session chair if you prefer. I don't know what the recommended alternative. I think the recommendation uh, is that I do, but I'll, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Okay. So I don't know who is in charge, but the, uh, the session following this one is one session where I'm chairing. I don't know who will be the student host there. Yeah, but so both, both, both Fook and Aparna are present. Those are the two student volunteers. Uh, Fook is at the moment host. Uh, so one of the two will pass it over to you, I guess. I guess I'm in a different room, so ah, maybe okay. it's a different. Then it's going to be different. Yeah. All right, I'll mute myself. Okay. Okay. Okay, so everybody. I'm just, backup, I'm just backup session chair since you're on already, and I assume that I'll have to do nothing. Hello, now. everyone. Oh. Yeah. Hello. Oh, Adibet, I didn't realize your backup session. Okay, even better. Thanks that you're thanks that you're there, but I'm I'm convinced it will work out somehow. Great. Okay. So uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Felix Nauman. I'm going to be hosting uh, this session here about data cleaning, curation, and analytics. So we have five talks lined up. So this is going to be five videos, um, but uh, we also have the authors or presenters uh, present, and we'll do a Q and A after each talk. Uh, in general, I, I would ask you to mute yourselves while uh, the talks are going on and I will call on you and, and ask questions in the Zoom chat and I will call on you uh, to then ask the question in person, uh, you know, by audio or even by video and then the, uh, the speaker can uh, respond to those questions. If it doesn't work out technically, I'll just read aloud the questions in the Zoom uh, chat and then we'll see what goes on. Uh, there's also a Slack channel um, um, one of the student volunteers will be monitoring that. I'm trying to avoid monitoring uh, two chat channels, so preferably use the Zoom chat, uh, and some of you have already done so. So uh, I think without further ado, we can, we can go to our first uh, speaker, uh, uh, Alex Bugatu. Uh, he will be talking about data set discovery, so this is really a, a great and important topic. Uh, Alex is from the University of Manchester, so it's already the evening uh, where he is. He started 2020 um, with a successful uh, uh, PhD defense, and he's currently building data discovery and data matching pipelines at Peak AI. Um, and I think uh, this is enough said. Uh, let's have a look uh, at his video, at his talk. And Alex is also present uh, by video, as you can see. So, Fook, do you want to start the video? Hello, everyone. My name is Alex. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about data set discovery in big data repositories such as data lakes. This work is the result of joint research done with Dr. Alvaro Fernandez, Professor Norman Patton, and Dr. Nicolas Constantino at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. So given the recent advancements in data management, it has become quite easy for organizations around the world to store data, and many of them do so. The problem appears though when a user such as, uh, such as a data scientist tries to find uh, data, to identify data in a potentially large repository that is useful for a given analytical task. We model this problem uh, around a given target schema uh, and we are trying to find in our potentially large pool of sources those tables that are most useful for populating the target input by means of, uh, of data integration. And by most useful, we mean data sets that are desirably unionable with the target and may be joinable among themselves. 
to have a clearer understanding and a clearer view of what we're trying to achieve here, consider the following example that uses information about uh, general practitioner surgeries in the United Kingdom. So we have a target, you can see it here, and we have a number of attributes that we want to populate. Then imagine we have a, a large repositories and out of all the data sets in that repository, S1, S2, and S3 are relevant for populating the target. But we're trying to, we're trying to identify, we're trying to create a solution that will be able to search and identify these three sources as being the ones desired for populating the target. In this particular case, S1 and S2 can populate practice, street, CT, and postcode in the target, whereas S3 can populate opening hours um, can through the, the opening hours parameters can uh, attribute can populate the hours attribute in the target, and the way we're we're doing this is by identifying the fact that S1 and S2 are maybe unionable with the target, and and then S3 is uh, either unionable with the target through these two attributes or maybe joinable with S1 uh, or S2, and we can use that information to populate um, hours, uh, the hours attribute in the target. So this is what we're trying to achieve uh, here. So essentially, we are splitting the problem into a problem of unionability discovery and a problem of joinability discovery. And we're gonna start with the former, and we're gonna show how we first identify unionable attributes, and then we, we move to unionable tables. So imagine a pool of sources, and we want to find attributes in, uh, of those data sets, attributes that are unionable. And for that, we're looking at attribute names and at attribute values. Now, a naive approach here would be to extract the names and, and the value and the attribute extents, and for each one to do an all against all comparison. Clearly, that's, that, that is not feasible. So then we employ hashing techniques to speed up this comparison. Specifically, we are using mean hash and random projections hash algorithms because they have a remarkable property. Inputs that are similar will result in outputs with a high probability of collision, therefore um, uh, similar outputs. And we are, so instead of comparing attribute names or comparing attribute values, we are comparing hash codes obtained um, uh, by applying one of these algorithms on, um, on, the, on the attribute names and attribute values. And because we are using these type of, of hashing algorithms, we can then use uh, nearest neighbor search techniques, such as locality sensitive hashing, to do two things. Firstly, uh, to group together uh, attributes that are similar, that are sim potentially similar, and crucially, to reliably estimate uh, a measure of their similarity. In this case, for attribute names, the measure will be jacquard, and in fact, whenever we're, we are using min hash, the estimated measure would be jacquard similarity, whereas when we're using random projections, the estimated measure will be the cosine similarity. So in this case, uh, we will be able to create four LSH, locality sensitive hash indexes, four data structures, each one of which will group together attributes that are similar as per the type of evidence used to create each index. From attribute names, we will have, we will create one index, the name index. From attribute values, we will create three indexes. This, this means that we will extract three types of evidence. We will use the values themselves, and we will compare the set of values of each attribute. We will use the format of those values in the form of regular expressions. And we use the embeddings of each value, where an embedding is a numeric representation of the value extracted using natural language processing techniques. So having these four types of indexes, uh, we can then identify unionable attributes. And uh, note that we can apply the exact same technique on the target. Assuming the target presents some exemplar tuples, we can apply the exact same technique on the target so that some buckets of some of the indexes will now contain some target attributes as well. Attributes that, source attributes that share 
a bucket with one target attributes are considered unionable candidates with that target attributes. Now, this leads us to, uh, to another, uh, to the next step in, in our process where we consider each pair of attributes for each, there is evidence in at least one of the indexes of, of similarity, and we consider each such pair, and as we, we discussed earlier, we quantify from out of each index, we quantify, uh, we, we estimate, sorry, we estimate a measure of similarity of those attributes. So if TI is a target attribute and AJ is some uh, attribute from, from a source table, we have, we can, using the indexes, we can extract four types of similarity. Now, to these four types, we add a fifth one if the two uh, attributes are numerical. So if the two attributes are numerical, we also measure the distance between the, their probability distribution of values. Right? So now having five types of evidence uh, and five, five measures of similarity, we, we aggregate them to a single value. This value will be the measure of unionability between those two attributes. Now, this measure is computing using a weighted scheme that is uh, described in the paper. In a nutshell, it uses optimization and machine learning uh, algorithms to identify weights for each of these type of evidence, right? So this is how we identify unionable attributes. Now, if you consider a table S that has an attribute AI and not an attribute AJ, each one of which is related, is similar to some target attribute, we can consider these two pairs, apply the process that we previously seen to obtain a measure to quantify their, their similarity or their reunionability. And then we, uh, we w aggregate again to a different weighting scheme, this time using probabilistic weights, again, described in, in the paper. So at this moment, we have a unionability measure for each, for, each, um, for each table with respect to the target. This allows us to do the following. Given our target, we can apply unionability discovery and treat the result as a ranked retrieval problem, meaning that from the result, we can rank, rank each item based on uh, their score, their unionability score computed as previously seen, and consider, for instance, just the top K most unionable um, attributes with the target. Now, for our second part, the question is, how about the target attributes that are not covered by the unionability discovery process? How about attributes in the target that may be covered by some other sources that are not in the top K. How can we identify those sources? And in order to do that, we use the joinability discovery process, which is essentially it's a, it's a discovery of mutual joinability between sources in the top K. Specifically, from our top K results, we consider our top K results together with other, with, 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 with other sources that are not in the top K, and we consider our value index. Recall that our LSH value index was grouping together attributes that had overlap in values. And out of this index, we can create um, a graph at data set level, well, where each node is a data set, S1, S2, and so on, and each edge links together two joinable data, data sets. For instance, if S2 and S6 are, are, are linked by, by an edge, it means that there are two attributes in the value index, one from S2 and one from S6, that join the same, that, sorry, that shame, uh, share the same bucket, and that one of those attributes is a candidate key. Having such a graph allows us to identify join paths in it, and having a join path that starts from one of the top K uh, data sets, one, one, data, one of the data sets that is in the top K uh, unionability results, we consider the other data sets in the, in the join path as being relevant for populating some target atom. So this is how we identify joinability, and this is how we increase our, we extend our top key result with other data sets that are relevant for populating the target, right? So now, 
just to give you a sense of how all this how all this perform performs in practice let me just give you some 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 example of the evaluation we perform in in the paper in this first example we use our technique uh, D3L called data, from dataset discovery in data lakes and we measure the precision and recall against two of the of the state of the art alternative Orum and table union search so what happens here is that for we for each target we, uh, we so we pick the target randomly and um, we measured the precision of the of the result uh, with varying uh, values of k. So for instance, when we retrieve the top 20 most unionable data sets, we obtain a precision more of more than 90%, and there's a significant increase in precision compared with the baselines. For recall, again, when, when, when we retrieve just 20 data sets, obviously recall is poor because, well, there are probably more than, in our data lake, there were more than 20 data sets um, uh, relevant uh, for, for populating uh, the target used. Uh, so then uh, we only measure recall in the top 20, so then obviously there are many misses. But as, as uh, K increases, recall increases as well, and the significant increase, increase that we've seen in precision is preserved in recall um, as well. Now, let's see what happens when we bring in data sets from join paths. So here, what we have, we have the target coverage, meaning the ratio of, of, uh, of target attributes that are covered by some uh, data set in the result. Again, we vary K, and we can see a dramatic increase in coverage. And this, is, this tends to be constant because, well, from 20 data sets or even from, from 10 or 5, uh, from 10 data sets, um, we are able to follow the joint graph that, that, that we create to identify most of the other data sets that contribute some values or some attributes to the target, right? So, and these top 20 are still in the result when we retrieve 200 and so on. And with respect to attribute precision, which, is, which measures how many of those attributes that cover the target are indeed correct, we can see that when we retrieve between 20 and, 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 and 100 or, or so, we have good, very, good and very good precision. As we retrieve more and more, obviously, um, uh, precision, uh, attribute precision decreases because we bring in more false positives. So this is just, uh, in a nutshell, how this technique performs in practice and what, uh, what, what it can do, right? So some key takeaways that I think are, are, are important here, firstly, we are, we are using schema and instant level features that uh, improve our effectiveness. And uh, we are using these features in such a way that uh, make our solution, solution lenient with respect to data inconsistencies where we don't expect, for instance, data values to be rep represented in the same way. Uh, secondly, we use multiple types of evidence. So then if uh, some of the data sets don't contain some type of evidence, so we can extract some type of evidence for, from those data sets. We can still identify their reunionability and joinability. Thirdly, the aggregation schemes that we use uh, are created in such a way to balance the strength of the similarity signal of each individual, individual evidence type. And lastly, we use joint paths that, as we've seen, maximize the target coverage. So this is our proposal for data set, uh, for data set discovery. Any questions you may have uh, based on this presentation or even based on the paper, if you had a chance to look at it, uh, are, are welcome. And uh, thank you very much for, um, uh, for listening. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Alex. Um, I guess the applause will be, have to be virtual. If people like, you can add a reaction by, by clapping. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Alex. You should probably unmute yourself. Um, are there any questions? I think, you know, I haven't seen, okay, I see one from Renee. Renee, why don't you quickly unmute yourself and, and ask the question? If, uh, if thanks for a very nice talk, Alex. That was very nice. Um, and for joint discovery, it's, it's well known that JCART is biased to small sets. So you're, it's uh, using JCART is likely to hurt recall. And you didn't, in the talk, mention recall on the join path part. Do you have a sense of, of what the recall is in your approach? Um, so 
for so for for the the, the types of measures that uh, rely on jacquard similarity, uh, I think all but one. Well, no, all but two of them. Um, there's a, there's an experiment in the paper where uh, we report precision and recall for each individual type of evidence. And uh, indeed, there are some types of evidence that rely on jacquard similarity and have poor, uh, worse recall, recall than, for instance, the, the one that uses embeddings and, and, and therefore uses cosine similarity. Um, but it, it, it is not clear, I, I can't give a definitive answer whether or not this is because of the use of jacquard or because of the type of evidence. So in short, I don't think I have a definitive answer for, for that. I am aware of that, uh, of, of that weakness of Jacquard of being sensible to, uh, sensitive to, to, to data sets with, to, to, to sets with, with skewed uh, lens. Um, but we didn't uh, measure this. We just assumed um, where the, the, the lens of, of the sets are, are um, close to each other. Okay. So I guess this is uh, future work or, or good well, yeah, warning that, that's a, for the future. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a good yeah. warning. Okay. And we're, we're actually about to apply this in practice uh, in the next few months. And if uh, we'll, we'll probably uh, have to deal with, with this problem. Okay. So Davoud, you had a question. Uh, do you want to uh, say that? Out yes. But, yeah, the question is uh, basically you showed the performance improvement in terms of precision compared to table union search. Uh, so some insight on where the improvements are coming from and also uh, maybe some comments on the data set that you're using and maybe the ground truth. Right. So um, the improvement uh, from what we've seen comes from uh, the fact that uh, table union search tends to rely on, uh, on values with the same uh, representation. So as soon as you change something in like a, even a comma or something in the values, um, a table new search tends to miss those values. So that's one of, I think, one major uh, improvement. And a second um, uh, source of improvement, I think, is from the way we measure, uh, we, we create these, these measures of unionability. Mm -hmm. um, in table union search, there's a second step where uh, the measures are, are uh, estimated probabilistically are extracted probabilistically from, from the indexes, where in our case, we use the, the actual measures returned by the indexes. And this tends to, again, to show an improvement. Uh, with regard to the ground truth, um, there were two types of, uh, of, of, of data lakes, as it were, that were used. Uh, one of them comes, is the same one uh, uh, made available by the authors of table union search. Um, and that was uh, more of a synthetic one. And uh, the, we have a real world based data, data lake and the, the results from the presentation are based on, on, on that real world one that has been manually created with data from, uh, from with open government data from data graphic from various domains. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, is that, so, is that data set available? Sorry. So, uh, it, it is not available. Uh, I've tried to make it available. The problem was that some of the, the, the data sets that uh, have been used didn't have a clear uh, policy with regard to, with, uh, to, to uh, reusability. So then I, I just I didn't want to risk and, and put it online. But um, if you're interested, I can give you a list of the data sets used, existing in that, in that data lake and uh, you can find them on data graphic okay. So. Life here is the same as at a real world conference because time, regardless of whether it's online or offline or in person, proceeds in the same speed everywhere in the world. So uh, what I'm trying to say is, is uh, that we won't have time for another question, but of course there's the chat. So uh, for all speakers now, uh, you know, um, uh, feel free to have a look at, so I see Mayuresh also has a question. So Alex, you might have a look at that. Don't answer it in the chat now because it will be distracting for uh, the other speakers, but maybe you want to contact each other after, after this session. Okay. Sure. okay. So thanks again, Alex, uh, uh, for, for the nice talk and, and, uh, and uh, the interesting Q&A. So I would uh, now uh, go over to the next uh, talk. This will be by Yu Sun um, about uh, repairing data. Uh, Yu Sun is a PhD candidate in, at Tsinghua University uh, in China. 
uh, his research is fittingly in data quality and uh, uh, data cleaning, his research interests. And actually we have two talks from that university, but no overlap uh, in the authors. So these are gonna be two separate papers, but let's start uh, with uh, Yusun's talk about repairing. Good afternoon, my name is Yu Sun from Tsinghua University, China. Today, I would like to introduce our work, Swalking Repair for Misplaced Attribute Values. Here is the outline. I will start with the motivation followed by our solution and the experiment results. Finally, I will give a conclusion of our work. First, let's consider a real turbine scenario. The turbine sensor readings are transmitted to data center without height information. Then the data center will collect this data with predefined height. For example, when turbine transmit a comma-separated record for device 27, this record will be collected by data center using the predefined height. The first value will be collected as device ID, and the others are identified as time, wind speed, and the year. Then a tuple for device 27 is collected in the data center. However, owing to the application requirement, turbines and the data collection protocol may upgrade, while the data collection protocol is updated immediately in the turbine device. The modification of schema definition in the data center is delayed, but the sensor readings may be still recorded in the upgrade of turbines. As shown, the turbine still generates a common separated record, but with a new protocol, where the third value changes to denote the year attribute, and the fourth one is wind speed value. When data center collects this data with the old protocol, the true value 2017 year is misplaced in the wind speed attribute, and the wind speed value is collected in the year attribute. Then the misplaced values are thus observed in the data center. Misplaced errors may also occur in the NoSQL database application. In NoSQL database, since the key names denoting the same attribute may be different when recorded by different users, it's usually hard to identify which keys indeed denote the same attribute when extracting data from the original white column table. For example, when we hope to know what is the first name and the last name collected in tuple T2 and T3, it cannot automatically answer our query, since T2 and T3 don't use first name and last name as their key to store the data. Therefore, we may use an alignment table to indicate which key names denote the same attribute, and these keys will be recorded in the same column family. For example, since the key name F name and uh, family name are similar with first name. These three keys may be misaligned in the same column family to denote user's first name. Then the family name Michelle or T3 is misplaced in the first name column as well. Misplaced data are also observed in the medical data. As shown in the example, the code of 41 in the sex or baby column is obviously incorrect as the sex information for patient 20. The reason is that, as shown in the original medical records, the sex information is missing in the first record for patient 20. When extracting this record into the table, since the sex column is missing, all the values afterwards are misplaced one column to the left. Therefore, the extraction error and the shift error occur in the medical data. Similarly, shift error may also occur in the procurement data, where both the values and the fields use comma as their separator. 
as shown in the example, since the value in second record contains common separator to separate its value, it will be mistakenly divided into two different fields when extracting the record into the table. Then the misplaced data could occur with a shift error in the afterward fields. As shown in the previous examples, misplaced errors could be introduced generally in all ETL steps, ranging from data production to consumption, including the entry error in turbid data, extraction error in medical data, alignment error in NoSQL database application, and the shift error in medical data and the procurement data. Then we first consider an example of turbine data to introduce the intuition of our proposal. Owing to the inconsistent protocol upgrade, the voltage and temperature values in the latest record T0 are misplaced. In order to get a better understanding of the misplaced data, we use a parallel coordinate figure to show the data tuples, where each vertical axis is related to an attribute, and each polygonal line denotes one tuple showing the value changes between different attributes. As shown, the misplaced values of voltage and the temperature attribute values in T0 are very different to those in the nearby tuples T5, T6, and T7. The existing in attribute repair method usually uses the value in the same attribute domain to repair the misplaced errors following a minimum change principle. For example, it may use 16.8 to repair T0 voltage and 31.7 to repair T0 temperature, which are most similar with the original misplaced values. However, as shown in the parallel coordinate figure, the repair is not accurate enough since it ignores the true values of voltage and temperature in T0. In this sense, we propose to consider the in-tuple repair by swapping the data in the tuple. As shown in the parallel coordinate figure again, if we swap the voltage and the temperature values of T0 with true misplacement values, it will account perfectly with other tuples having similar timestamps, for example, T5, T6, and T7. On the other hand, to evaluate whether misplaced data are correctly repaired, the minimum change principle does not help. As shown in the example, owing to the failing mistakes by passengers, a value passport is misplaced in the passenger name which should belong to the travel document attribute instead. And the passenger name John Eden is misplaced into travel document. Therefore, marrying the swapping repaired values, passport and John Eden is meaningless since they are from the different domains. And the previous parallel coordinate figure also shows the minimum change principle cannot help us get an accurate repair for misplaced turbine data. At the same time, data sparsity and heterogeneity make the value distribution could also be unreliable. As shown in the original value distribution figure, we observe the value distributions of two different samples randomly sampled from the same data set. The value distribution of sample one is largely different from that of sample two, so the value likelihood computed based on these inconsistent value distributions would be inaccurate. It's thus hard to find a repair for the misplaced turbine data, since 1540 in time attribute and 330 direction value never occurred in the previous records. In contrast, when we learn the distribution of distances between a tuple and its neighbors, as shown in the figure, more consistent distance distributions are observed in two different samples. The likelihood computed based on the consistent distance distribution would be more reliable, and making the swapping repaired tuple T0 prime in parallel coordinate figure accord perfectly with other tuples T5, T6, and T7. 
Therefore, we propose to learn the distance likelihood between a tuple and its neighbors by checking whether the tuples has values similar to other tuples in order to be tolerant to be to data sparsity and heterogeneity. If the tuple becomes similar to some neighbors after swapping certain attribute values, we would assure the misplacement and the repair. For example, as shown in the figure, after swapping repair, T0 prime becomes more similar to other tuples T3, T4, and T7. We first consider a special case where all tuples are considered as the neighbors of T0. Then the problem can be solved as a assignment problem using Hungary method with a polynomial complexity where n is tuple size and m is a tribute number. Given the solution with all neighbors, in order to compute the optimal swapping repair with general k neighbors, the most intuitive idea is to consider all the k tuple subsets as potential k neighbors and compute the optimal repair over each subset. Finally, return the one with minimum distance cost between them. For example, given a relation instance with eight tuples, we consider all the possible k neighbor subsets with three tuples, such as the first one subset consisting of T1, T2, and T3 tuples. Until all the possible k neighbor subsets are considered, we return the one with the minimum distance cost between them as the final swapping repair result for T0. However, the complexity is too large, which is exponential with k. We thus design further approximation method by considering a number of fixed neighbor subsets. Intuitively, the k neighbors of a tuple should be close with each other as well. We may consider only the k neighbors of each tuple as a potential k neighbor subsets. For example, we may first consider T1 with its k neighbors T2 and T3 as a first potential subset. After considering all the tuples with their k neighbors, we also return the optimal repair with the minimum distance cost between them as the final repair result. As shown in the summary table, the method with fixed size of neighbors is more efficient than considering all the possible k neighbor subsets by reducing the complexity from exponential to quadratic relationship. In addition to the studied misplaced errors, our proposal is also compatible with the existing in attribute method to repair mixed errors. We can use our proposed method to conduct swapping repair first. Then in Existing in attribute repair can be applied to repair in attribute errors, since applying first the in attribute repair would destroy the original ground truth or misplaced values. In experimental study, we evaluate both the swapping repair performance and the joint repair accuracy. For mixed errors, we introduce both misplaced errors and the in attribute errors, including constant detectable errors, outliers, and the missing values. Since no existing studies dedicated to repairing misplaced errors, for reference, we report the results for inattribute repair method. As shown in the figure, our proposed SIFN method is very effective in repairing misplaced errors. Indeed, it's not a fair comparison, and a more reasonable and practical evaluation is to perform joint repair. So we conduct joint repair experiments over mixed errors, where our proposal SIFN is paired with existing in attribute repair methods. The joint repair shows better performance than any individual ones. SIFN plus DD and SCALE show higher accuracy. The result is not surprising referring to their better performance of DD and SCALE. Finally, we conclude that our proposed swapping repair method based on maximum distance likelihood is effective in handling misplaced errors, and is also compatible with existing methods to handle mixed errors. That's all about our work. Please feel free to ask me questions. Thank you for listening. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the nice talk on this really interesting and important topic. So just a short comment for me, I see these misplaced values all the time. Actually, there are also many examples where these values are misplaced on purpose, not to hide anything, but because there's no proper field to put a value, let's say the email address of a person suddenly shows up in the middle name or so. So these might be also issues that you could think about. Uh, so if anybody has questions, maybe we'll have a mode where you just basically just, you know, raise your hand in the chat, just saying I have a question and then I'll call upon you. Uh, maybe this is something. Uh, so I'm just looking at the, ch the chat. So you don't write your whole question. Just basically say I have a question uh, or unmute yourself and ask it. Okay. So apparently there's, there's, there's no further question. So, I mean, uh, so since I made that comment just now, uh, you, so uh, have you seen these examples as well? I mean, you showed lots of examples from different papers. Uh, these, you know, maybe not really misplaced values, but poorly placed values where, where people just, where there's no proper field to put the value. Does that confuse your approach? So people just entering something into a field that belongs nowhere. You mean the, the if people input the incorrect fields, uh, that would destroy my method? Yeah, incorrect fields in the sense of, of, of they misuse columns, right? So so let's say you, you get an email address from a person, but the form does not contain email address, right? But it will contain, you know, second name. And if that person doesn't have a, or middle name, if that person doesn't have a middle name, it might be convenient to just put the email address into that field because there's no proper field. Uh, I mean, have you observed these, this effect and, and how would your approach deal with that? Yes, if we have enough tuples have the correct fields, our method is uh, very effective to handle them. and. Uh, we can we can find for for each potential misplaced uh, trivial tuple, we may find whether swapping repair can help you find to have many to have more similar tuples. And uh, if we have if if we don't have enough mm. if if we don't have enough neighbors to have similar values with it, it may be hard to yeah. conduct swapping repair. Yeah. So if somebody, if we, yeah. So if somebody yes. systematically misuses something, then you would, you know, recognize it. But if it's spurious, it will be more difficult, I guess. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. I don't see any further questions, so I think we'll just uh, move on. Thank you again. You uh, again. There's a clapping symbol if people want to find it. Uh, but uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, very nice. So let's move on Thank to you. the next. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker. This is Yu Yu Lu, uh, also from uh, Tsinghua University. Um, he's a, a second-year master student um, and also interested in data cleaning and visualization. And this is also a collaboration uh, with Nan Tang from Qatar uh, Computing Research Institute. I think Nan is also uh, present here. Maybe some other uh, co-authors as well. And when we play the video, I think some of you will recognize the voice. So go ahead and play the video. Hello everyone, we are a database group from Tsinghua University. Today, we will present our work interactive cleaning for progressive visualization through composite questions. Let us start with an overview of the typical data analytics pipeline. First, the user may collect data from multiple sources and then transform and clean the data for analytics. However, the visualization results are not always exact and good. One common reason is that real life data is dirty. Moreover, it is too expensive to completely clean a data set and then for visualization or any other analytics task. Let us see an example. We have a publication data set collecting from six data sources such as Google Scholar, DBLP. We want to visualize a bar chart to show the total citations of each conference. Due to various types of errors, the visualization is incorrect. For example, outliers affect the height of the bar. In this work, we consider four types of data errors, tuple-level duplicates, synonyms, missing values, and outliers. However, visualization is not necessarily dirty, even if the data is dirty. Consider another example. It visualizes a pie chart that shows the proportions of total papers by year. Although data is dirty, 
the pie chart is not affected by dirty data because the proportion of the number papers by year is the same as ground truth data. The true reason is that the visualization distance is too small. Therefore, we have some observations from examples. First, data cleaning is expensive. Second, some data errors may not significantly affect the visualization result. Therefore, can we just clean visualization aware data errors to reduce the cleaning costs and speed up the visualization analytics process? We study a new problem that is progressively turning bad visualizations into good ones by interactive data cleaning. Now, we have a data set with some errors, and we study how to clean visualization aware errors to progressively improve the quality of visualization. There are four main challenges in this work. First, how to quantify the impact of cleaning visualization aware errors. Second, how to quantify the visualization quality between visualizations before and after the data is cleaned. How to interact with the user to clean the various types of errors and how to select the most beneficial cleaning questions. For the second challenge, we propose to use distance functions to measure the visualization distance so as to quantify the improvement of visualization quality after a round of cleaning. The distance functions can be earth movers distance, Euclidean distance and so on. For each type of error, we can use the existing techniques to detect and generate repairing candidates and ask the user to check. For example, for tuple level duplicates, we employ entity resolution techniques to detect duplicates and use active learning techniques to select questions to interact with the user. We call such questions as single questions. However, it is hard for a user to precisely answer a data cleaning question without enough context. Interactive data cleaning systems typically provide more information to the user beyond only one data error. Moreover, it is also observed that different errors may impact each other. Therefore, we propose to use one graph model to organize different types of errors. Now, we introduce errors and repairs graph, an undirected weighted graph. In the graph, each vertex represents a tuple, each edge with weight denotes that the associating two vertices are possible tuple level duplicates or synonyms. Those vertices in the same color mean that they have the same synonyms. Now, we address the third challenge by using the composite questions graph. A composite questions graph is a connected induced subgraph of an errors and repairs graph. The user can interact with the composite question graph to provide feedback. For example, the user can approve the edge to denote its associated two vertices are the same tuple level entity and synonyms. This is the solution overview of our work. First, the user needs to specify a visualization query on a dataset. The VisClean RST needs to run off the shelf data cleaning tools to detect different types of errors and generate possible repairs. It then builds an errors and repairs graph to organize the detected data errors and possible repairs. It then selects the most beneficial composite questions graph from the errors and repairs graph based on the benefit model to interact with the user in each iteration. After getting feedback from the user, it will repair data errors and refresh the data visualization. The above steps repeat until the budget is used up. This is the front end of our system. Next, we show a quick overview of our system. After that, we will give more technical details. First, we can upload and select a dataset for visualization. Then we can browse the selected dataset. This is a database papers dataset with six attributes, which contains tuple level duplicates, attribute level duplicates, missing values. Next, we specify a visualization query to generate a bar chart that shows the top 10 venues ranking by total citations. We can see that the bar chart is incorrect due to various data errors. The VisClean system will automatically detect data errors and generate a composite questions graph in the back end. The selected composite questions graph will be shown in the interaction panel. In the graph, each node represents a tuple, each edge with weight denotes that the associating two nodes are possible tuple level duplicates or attribute level duplicates. Those nodes in the same color mean that they have the same synonyms for the x-axis of the bar chart. 
For each edge, the user can con RM the edge to denote its associated two vertices are the same tuple level or attribute level entity, or split the edge to shows they are not the tuple level or attribute level entity. For example, when the mouse moves on node 302, we can see that the attribute for node 302 is IETKDE, and the attribute for associating nodes is VLDB. Therefore, we can click the red button to split all edges connecting to node 302 to denote there are not the same tuple level and attribute level entities. After clicking, the graph will be updated immediately. We continue to interact with the system. For this subgraph, we can see the attribute of the blue node is SIGMOD, while the attribute of its associating nodes is VLDD. Therefore, we can conclude that the tuple level entity and attribute level entity of the blue node is not the same as those black nodes. Thus, the user can click the red button to split these edges. We continue to interact with the system. After several interactions, the user can return the label answer. Then, the system will repair errors and update the visualization. After 14 iterations, we can see that the bar chart is very similar to the one generated by Ground Truth dataset. Then, the user can save the cleaned version of the visualizations and dataset. Next, we will introduce how to select the composite questions graph. We first discuss how to quantify the benefit of a composite question graph. Given a composite questions graph, the user can operate the graph to provide feedback. For example, the user may confirm the edge, T1, T2, in probability P, after this operation. It will result in a new version of dataset D2, and the visualization will be updated by D2. Therefore, the expected benefit of a user operation can be computed as a probability multiply visualization distance. Formally, we can sum the expected benefit of each operation to measure the benefit of asking a composite question graph. After we know how to estimate the benefit of a composite questions graph, we now introduce the problem of composite questions graph selection. Given an errors and repairs graph and an integer k, the optimal composite questions graph selection problem aims to compute a connected subgraph with k vertices with maximal benefit. Unfortunately, we have proven that this problem is NP-hard by a direct reduction from the clique problem. Therefore, we present a greedy algorithm to compute the composite question graph. The basic idea is that we compute the subgraph with large benefits as candidates greedily and incrementally. This is an overview example of our algorithm. First, we use the benefit model to compute the edges benefit of the errors and repairs graph. We assume the size of the composite questions graph is 4. Since we want to incorporate edges with large benefits into composite questions graph, we sort edges based on the benefit in descending order and iterate on each of them. In the first iteration, we select edge B since it has the maximal benefit. In the fifth iteration, we select edge A and add its two vertices into the vertices collection. Now, the size of the vertices collection is equal to 4, hence, we construct a subgraph G1 and compute its benefit. After iterating all edges, we construct two subgraphs, and we select the subgraph with maximum benefit as the output. We used three datasets for the experiment and conducted 18 visualization tasks on those datasets. We tested five algorithms for question selection problem, two of them are our proposed algorithms. We concisely show an end-to-end -end evaluation of our system in this presentation. We use the earth mover's distance as a metric for evaluation. The EMD can quantify the visualization distance between current visualization and the ground truth visualization. The smaller the EMD is, the better the visualization quality is. As shown in the figures, we can see that the EMD for all visualization tasks decreases in the interactive cleaning process. Let's show more details using the first visualization task. The visualization task Q1 visualizes the top 10 venue ranking by total citations. The initial visualization is very dirty due to various types of errors. 
We need to ask hundreds of single questions to clean the entire dataset to produce the ground truth. In our system, we just use 15 composite questions to clean it and get a result that is very close to the ground truth. We can make a similar observation on the pie chart. We make two observations from this group of experiments. First, VisClean can significantly improve the visualization quality with a small budget. Second, cleaning different visualizations generated from the same dataset needs different budgets. In this paper, we have studied the problem that is progressively turning bad visualizations into good ones by interactive data cleaning. We have presented an errors and repairs graph to model all possible errors and repairs. We have also proposed to use the composite question, that is a group of single questions, to be treated as one question, to ask the user. Finally, we have devised an effective and efficient composite questions selection algorithm that asks the most beneficial question to generate the best visualization results. Experimental results on real datasets have shown that our methods can generate high-quality visualizations by asking a small number of questions. The above is today's presentation, thank you for listening, and welcome to Ask Questions. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, you for this uh, for this uh, interesting topic, uh, progressive visualization. So we don't have too much time, but uh, uh, maybe there's one or two questions um, uh, from the audience. I'm checking the the channel. Okay, I mean I, I do have a few because I I really think it's it's pretty interesting. Actually, I have a question right from the beginning where you said visualization distance, and I thought, okay, this sounds like an interesting question. And then you said you could use anything like Earth move of its distance and Euclidean distance. So, but I didn't quite get it. So what is the Euclidean distance between two bar charts? Uh, uh, or how would you define visualization distance? Uh, yes. Uh, in this world, we uh, man, man, many uh, discuss the visual types such as the bar chart and pie chart. Uh, behind the bar chart, the data, uh, behind, the, behind the bar chart, the, if you want to measure the difference between two bar chart, uh, Intuitively, we should uh, measure the data uh, behind the two bar chart. So we can use the uh, Earth mover distance to um, measure how different the two bar charts. Okay, but I thought the whole point is is to to not focus on the data, but to say, well, look, this this error here in the data might cause a big distance, but in the visualization it doesn't really show much, right? And that's, I think that, I thought that's the whole, or one of the key insights of, of, of the paper. So maybe maybe then as future work or so, you could actively think about how to distinguish or, or how to measure, is this a big difference in visualization, yes or no, per visualization and not per underlying data? Just a thought. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Murad has a question. Murad, go ahead. If you want to unmute yourself. Yes, sure. Yeah, just I was curious to know what kind of, of uh, some practical settings where you think that your system could be useful? Uh, you mean uh, some practical settings? Uh, yeah, we should... how I would use this thing in practice? Yes, uh, in current, currently, uh, in this work, we use the budget to uh, to quantify the interaction between the users. Okay, so Murad, maybe you want to take that offline uh, if, uh, and 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 uh, oh, sure. get, a, get a get a longer longer answer. I see I see you you have in the background a, a clock to show us what time you have locally. That's nice. So it's three oh one apparently. Uh, anyway, I think we need to move on because the video uh, uh, lasted quite long in my in my view. So so you thank you very much uh, uh, for for the nice talk and I think it was also interesting uh, for everybody to see how you use the uh, text to speech uh, to to make a nice talk. So uh, let's move on. Uh, our next speaker is Paolo Papotti, uh, who I've also seen here. Uh, so he will give uh, a talk about user-driven error detection and um, we'll have a look at the video and then uh, he's available for a Q&A. So Paolo uh, is uh, from Italy, uh, did his PhD in uh, the University of Roma Tre and uh, now is uh, in the data science department at Eurocom as a professor 
before that, he was with the QCRI group also for, for quite a while. And um, so there's a connection to the previous talk here in this sense. So take it away, the video, please. Hello, my name is Paolo Papotti. I'm an assistant professor at Eurocom in France, and it is joint work with my former PhD student, Kim Lee, who is now in uh, Vietnam. And our work is on the user-driven error detection for time series with uh, events. And time series are very important in many application domain. And in this uh, example, we are showing uh, at the top one plot where we are plotting values for a sensor in a, a real tank where there is a liquid uh, that is monitored. And we can see that over time there are some spikes in the values. Some of them are anomalies from one to four. And number five is instead a change point. It means that there has been a, an event from the outside that has changed the status of the system, but it is not an anomaly. Now, detecting these uh, anomalies is very important in many applications and fraud detection, for example, uh, for uh, time series with uh, financial data. And uh, the, the challenges that we see here apply also in other uh, applications. And the challenge is indeed the fact that we have uh, different points that we should recognize with different labels. As we can see from the second and the third plot, those are systems that are um, for outlier detection. And uh, we see that the anomalies that they identify, in some cases, like in the second plot, are correct but incomplete. While in the third plot, with the KNN approach, they can detect more, but uh, they are making good so many mistakes and they're still missing some of the anomalies. While at the bottom in the plot with the blue and the yellow lines, we see our, our system is able to detect both uh, anomalies and change points as different signals. So I'm going to tell you today some of the ideas that we used in order to make this possible. So first of all, why it is challenging? Well, we have to distinguish anomaly and events. They share some of the properties, so it's not obvious to recognize them. Second, the data set are uh, very heterogeneous, very different in the shapes of this time series. And the algorithms, most of the algorithms, they require users to set up some data set specific parameters. So this is something that requires domain expertise and uh, to be familiar with the methods at hand. And finally, in general, there are some uh, uh, supervised solutions that are based on label data, but this, this label data does not exist in some cases, so we need to create it, and this is quite a, an expensive effort in order to annotate these uh, um, anomalous points. So our solution builds on uh, two main ideas that address these uh, three points, these three challenges. The first one is that we introduce a novel concept of neighborhood that is effective in characterizing anomalies and change points in time series. We call it inverse nearest neighborhood, INN, and this is different from the traditional KNN because it exploits the uh, symmetry and asymmetry in the top K distance for a given point. So in the, we will see in a few minutes uh, how we identify that the INN of the point uh, uh, denoted with the star here, it's uh, the blue cloud, while uh, the KNN would be something different. And uh, what is especially important for this INN is that it is something that it's not specific to a given parameter, but it's something that depends on the shape of the data. So we don't have to define a parameter such as K, in, K for K and N. And the, and the second idea is to involve the user directly in the process of labeling the data. This, is, uh, this interactive approach uh, is based on uh, active learning, and the ideas that the user is giving us are value of confidence for the decisions on the predictions that he wants to satisfy, and we guarantee that these uh, requirements is satisfied by the points detected as anomalous or change points by the model, 
and uh, we keep asking for examples until this uh, properties are not guaranteed. So uh, we're going to look in more details at this plot of this table later, but we can see that we have multiple data sets. And what is important here is that we have a method that is without active learning, with active learning, and with a reasonably small number of questions to the user, we can almost double the quality of the detection. So how do we do this? Before getting into the details, a little bit of background. A time series for us is a set of data points indexed in time and uh, collected uh, uh, in equally spaced points in time. We use the Euclidean distance between two data points, so the straight line distance in, in, in computed as the square root of the differences between point coordinates. And uh, given that we have different uh, values uh, in different uh, uh, settings, we rescale the data distributions. So the overall mean and standard deviation are zero and one. So we'll do this standardization. And finally, we distinguish anomalies, which are values significantly different from the remaining data. They can be individual or collective. And the change points, which are points where the statistical properties of a sequence of observation change. So given these definitions, we can say that uh, with the user give us a confidence of the detection and the time series, we are in our problem, we are going to detect any anomaly, single or collective, A, and any change point C with a confidence above the user-defined confidence Q while minimizing the number of labor requests to the user. So our goal is to compute indeed the red, the orange, and blue lines at the bottom of this plot with the distinction between change points and anomalies while minimizing the number of times we ask the user to label points. So the basic idea is to use this INN. So the intuition of the INN can be explained very simply by looking at the greedy algorithm we used to create them. Uh, we define this as minimal, inverse, nearest neighbor. What's happening is that for the point hand, for example, the red star here in the middle, what we do is that we start from the top one, nearest neighbor, and we check that that point is also uh, adding the start point as a, near, a top one nearest neighbor. If it is the case, then they are in the INN. Then we do the same for the second point in the top two, top three, top four, to five, and so on. And we always check the symmetry that the same point is also in the uh, containing the examining point in the top, in the top uh, uh, neighbors. If it is true, they form together a minimal INN, and we stop where there are no more neighbors that are in the INNN condition. So for example, where this point is going to reach this point here at the bottom, possibly this is number 10, but if you look at the top 10 for the point here at the bottom, this guy is not there because there is someone closer around here, for example. Okay, so this is the nice idea that we use. This is useful to characterize the change points and anomalies, and uh, it does not depend on a certain parameter k that can be difficult to set and misleading in some cases, as we will see. Once we have this INN, we can define some scores that we're going to use for our model later as features. So we have the magnitude score, which is a global property of the uh, INN, comparing its size against the global dataset size. If the size is less than 5%, uh, it's, it's possible that it is an anomaly. If it's greater than that, it's uh, uh, the, more difficult. Correlation score represents our regularities and INN pattern over the entire data set. If it is rare, it's more likely to be a normal, so it is uh, modeling the periodic patterns. And the variance represents the local impact in terms of standard deviation if an INN is removed from the data. Closest to zero is likely to be normal. So we use these scores in our algorithm. Uh, combined with the, uh, the active learning. So we start with the textbook methods to detect possible candidates for anomalous points uh, by using the absolute second derivative. We, once we have all these candidates, we compute for each of them a score based on the four on the magnitude correlation and variance that we just saw for each candidate point. Please. 
And then we use a classifier that divides the points into change, anomaly, and normal ones with a given con with a, an output confidence weight. So it is very important because uh, we're using a uh, um, random forest here as the classifier. And uh, we, we will talk in a moment how we bootstrap this model. But basically, the important idea here is that uh, with the confidence weight is used to decide if a point is uh, trusted by the user. If it is not, then we trigger the, the active learning using the uncertainty sampling scheme. And uh, we go to the user to uh, label some of these points. We take the input on the user and we go back to three. We rerun the classifier until we converge on points that are all trusted. That means above with a confidence weight above the threshold given by the user. In terms of bootstrapping on the random forest, uh, we use some decision rules. And uh, the parameters for these rules are derived by unsupervised clustering of the points in the space of the scores. So for example, here we have two dimensions. And uh, we see that uh, the magnitude score and the variance score on the x-axis. And we see that the different points, they, are, they have different uh, places in the space. So we are able to cluster them and derive the parameters that are going to be useful for our decision views in order to take the decision and uh, uh, label for the training of the model. We tested this method on four different datasets. Three of them are real datasets. We created the first one from uh, uh, sensors from our partner. We have 3,000 records where we label both anomalies and change points. Then we have two larger datasets where they have only anomalies. And then we created a synthetic one in order to play with the combination of anomalies and change points based on the real data from the sensors that we knew. So this is one example of the shape of the data. You see that we have a single anomalies collecting anomalies and change points in the synthetic one. In the first experiment, we report on the quality of our method. So we have the four data sets. The simplest is the IoT one. The most complex is the synthetic at the top. You see that we have some uh, OK results compared to the other baselines in terms of unsupervised solution. But the results get much better with very few annotations from the user. So here, 4 points, 5.35, and more points for the most challenging data set. And we can get up to 100%, 80% in detection of anomalies and change points. Those are results where we were using the user confidence in 0 0.8. We report in the paper about the trade-off for using higher values for the user confidence. We compare against baselines. We have seven baselines for unsupervised uh, methods and uh, eight baselines for supervised ones. Our method uh, it's, uh, do, it is, is the best one for unsupervised. And for supervised, it's comparable only to one method for which we didn't have the code. So we compare against the results they report in their paper. You see that we have uh, comparable results, and but we have ma many, many less uh, annotations. Here, the model will train with 70% of the, of the data, while here we're using the few labels that I showed in the previous table. And we did more experiments also against baselines for change point detection, combination of change point detection and anomaly detection. And uh, also, we report on the uh, execution time. We see that our method is uh, here at the bottom. I, I don't have time to get into this in this presentation. You can find all the details in the paper. I just want to mention that we have here also an unoptimized naive version of our method. You see that it's much slower, so we were able to find some interesting optimization techniques in based on pruning, pruning and binary search in order to make our method as fast as the fastest commercial method out there. And I would like to conclude by mentioning that we also paired our method with a data repairing algorithm. It is from uh, Sigma 2015. And uh, here we're reporting the different results in terms of root mean square error in the cleaning process. So it is a comparison between the output of our repair algorithm and the gold instance. And uh, we can see that by selecting the points with uh, our method, uh, compared to without our method, the difference in the uh, in the mean uh, 
square, square error, it's quite big. So the quality of the instance that we uh, repair, it's uh, up to 10 times better, depending on the different datasets, of course. Those are the datasets from our synthetic generator. So to conclude, I introduce our approach to error detection for 10 series with enhanced user. And in the next steps, we would like to extend this to do data repairing with uh, INN. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paolo. Um, yeah, really interesting top, uh, topic and really good talk. So uh, any questions from the audience? We have 48 people in the audience. I'm sure there will be one or two questions. Yes, there's a question. This is Hamid. Go ahead. Hi, Hamid. Felix. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Hamid. So do you guys handle really the anomalies which are across uh, different time series? That is, anomalies that are detectable when you compare two different time series and you notice that they're not correlated Sounds or like coordinated. Paolo, you have to unmute. Uh, Yes, you thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, thank you for the question. So your question is, uh, if we have observed, uh, if we have tried to identify anomalies by instead of looking at one single time series, if we have looked at the opportunity coming from looking at uh, different time series that are related uh, somehow? Yeah, that's correct. That was the point. Oh, that's a great point. So uh, we haven't tried uh, this line. It was along the ideas that I discussed with the PhD student at some point, but uh, since we didn't have uh, uh, different sensors in our use case with the, with the industry that were measuring different uh, um, uh, features of the data, we were not able to conduct this line of research, but I think that it's, very, it's a very valid line, and, uh, but we haven't done it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? So I, I have a bunch of questions. Maybe I'll just ask one or two. So uh, one, I'm not an expert in this area of time series analysis and error detection. Is there anything else apart from anomalies and change points or like 10 different things you could be looking for and you chose those two or is that really kind of it? Well, there are many, there are many aspects that are present in time series such as, mm -hmm. for example, the, uh, how, how many time, the periodicity of the right. of the of, of the events and everything, right? So those are things that we we model indeed with our uh, features coming from the INN. So there are uh, indeed some other features that have been w well studied. There are some details that I don't say in the talk about how to uh, make these data regular, that such that can be observed in a certain okay. range that it's homogeneous across the time series. So all of these things are considered uh, standard and we, we apply them. But uh, I think that what, I mean, the message we wanted to give here is that uh, trying to do this joint detection give uh, advantage. And uh, that's why, that's our main Got point, it. I think. Okay. okay, anybody else? You could just unmute yourself and talk or send a short note in the chat. Yeah, this is Hamid. I just got another question. Go ahead. Okay, so do you do you do really window-based uh, anomaly detection, where we have a sliding windows, most usually actually a hopping windows. So when you slide the window, we have an overlap with the previous previous window, but then you're really focusing on the content of that window. An anomaly doesn't happen in one like one part of the. Uh, waveform you saw. It could be a bunch of them that they are happening at the same time with some gaps. So it's a window based ones and then you have to shift and then when you shift there's an overlap with the previous window. It's a much more complex and sophisticated way of doing it but it's very effective. I, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but again, this is something that we haven't done. I think that the reason is that perhaps we have been looking at uh, data sets with very, I mean not very, but 1% to few points percent of uh, anomalies. I think that your, uh, your suggestion may be very, very applicable in data sets with a higher rate, perhaps of anomalies, because in our, in our case, uh, uh, we were looking at the entire time series uh, as it was available. And uh, actually this looking at the global time series, it's very important for some of our uh, measures and uh, I haven't looked at this uh, window that uh, analysis. Okay, thank you. 
Thanks, Paolo. So I think we should move on, to be honest. So Paolo is available. You can also use the private chat uh, to contact Paolo um, or find his email address anyway. So, uh, so thanks again, Paolo. And let's, um, yes, great. Let's move to the uh, last uh, talk of the session. Uh, this is going to be uh, given uh, by Han Bing Zhang uh, about uh, agile analytics. Uh, and I think we'll have a look at the video first and then um, Han Bing, I see he's there. So he's available for Q&A later on. I'm sorry, we are running a few minutes late, but there's no a buffet that people will grab all the food away from you. So it's just your home. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we're, we're fine. Uh, sorry again for the slightly uh, longer session. So let's, let's play the video. Hello, everyone. I'm going to give a talk about a sample maintenance in Agile Analytics. I will introduce our works from the following sections. Firstly, I will give the motivation of our research. That is, when we will study a sample maintenance approach for Agile Analytics. Secondly, I will define the sample maintenance problem and introduce our methods. Finally, I will show our experiments and count our work. So, let's begin with my talk. In the year of big data, the data set is very large and it makes currency is more than before. This is an example of the currency of a single query on the large data set. In order to get the exact query result, the currency is more than 200 seconds for the 2.5 terabits data set and 3,000 seconds for the 7.5 terabits data set. To meet the requirement of template analytics, a personal query processing is a candidate kind of technique that can significantly reduce query latency. AQP is a sample-based approach. It generates many samples on the underlying data set. The, the user's query is executed on these samples, and then return an approximate query result. Users can set the error bound and the confidence level in their AQP queries to make the query accuracy meet their requirements. So, in BlinkDB, a sample-based engine, the Query length is less than 10 seconds for the two data sets, and the error is very little. Since the AQP is a sample-based approach, the pre-computed sample should be updated with the data update. Otherwise, the query accuracy will be degenerated by the engineer sample. For example, we want to get the total page view count of the wiki pages that belong to the project KK from wiki page view statistics data set. To evaluate the query accuracy, we use the relative error as the evaluation metric. We can see that with the data updated, the engineer sample will significantly increase the relative error. It makes the accuracy of a, a parent's query result cannot meet the user's requirement. So the user's decision may not be correct. In this paper, we study how to maintain the samples of AQP system in the mode of date batch update. As figure shown, with the new batch date BT plus 1 added in the base date DT at time T plus 1, the base date is changed to DT plus 1 at. Correspondingly, the sample needs to be updated from ST to ST plus 1 to guarantee the query accuracy. The natural sample update strategy is to contract a new sample ST plus one from scratch to replace the previous sample ST called resampling. But the cost of resampling is expensive when the size of base data is very large. It will cost tens of minutes to several hours or even more. Too many expensive resampling operations will reduce the agility of the system. So we need a method to reduce the cost of sample update. We found that it would be unnecessary for us to resample from scratch if the annealing date had not changed dramatically after including a new batch. In such a situation, we may update the sample incrementally without changing the sample size instead of resampling to significantly reduce the sample update cost while guaranteeing the query accuracy. Certainly, resampling is eventually unavoidable when the new batch it dramatically changes the underlying data distribution, so large sample is required. For example, on the centralized base date, 
we can use a small sample to get in the query accuracy. But when the new batch is in the base state, the updated data set is scattered. To get in the query accuracy as before, we need a large sample. Therefore, we define the problem in this paper and how to choose between the resampling strategy and the incremental update strategy to minimize the sample update cost while guaranteeing the query accuracy. We purposed an adaptive sample update approach, ASU, which is based on central limit theorem and cost form estimation. According to the estimated formula, ASU evaluates the changes of data distribution to decide whether resampling is indeed needed when new batch arrives. The estimation formula is different between the different average functions. We take average function as an example. On the base state, a pre-computed sample has been contracted to speed up the query process and the user specified error bound and the confidence level. We can get some st statistics, such as the size, this various sample size. When the new batch data is in the base state, we can update this statistics incrementally. And we can calculate a bound delta. If the changes of data distribution is larger than the bound, it means the new batch data dramatically changes the underlying data distribution, and the current sample size cannot meet the, meet the user's requirement. So we need to construct a large sample by resampling to guarantee the query accuracy. As of this, it means the current sample size can meet the user's requirement. So we can update the sample by an incremental sample update method. Therefore, for different aggregation functions and uh, attributions, we use the minimum value of multiple data as the low bound to determine resampling finally. To reduce the number of resamplings, we construct a sample that can meet a higher confidence level than the user specified confidence level when resampling. It can reduce the number of resamplings in the subsequent data updates. Furthermore, to further speed up sample update, we propose the TASU, which makes a trade-off between the query empty and the sample update speed. TASU can reduce the number of resampling in ASU. It uses an adaptive radar sampling point instead of the resampling to increase the sample size. But this approach will require the sample runners and hence sacrifice the query accuracy. This is an overview of an EQP system that integrates our RGO sample maintenance strategy. The system is composed of two parts, EQP engine and the sampling engine. The EQP engine is responsible for answering queries by leveraging on pre-computed samples. We can use an existing EQP engine into our system. The sampling engine is responsible for constructing and maintaining the samples. To target these changes, we implement a new sampling engine. According to the influence of the new batch on the current samples, we make the choice between the resampling strategy and the incremental update strategy. So here is the experiment setup. We compare four resampling ASU and TSU and evaluate the time cost of sample update and the relative error of query accuracy. We use the real-world DSI wiki and the synthetic DSI TPCH. For the wiki DSI, since the DSI is organized in sequential hours, we naturally divide the data into batches by hours. And the text queries we use include different aggregation functions and the predicts. For the TPCH DSI, we select four typical queries from the TPCH benchmark. A simple query Q6, two drawn queries Q14, Q19, and a grouping query Q1. We denoted them as Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4, respectively. Here is the promise combination between 4 and ASU on the wiki data side. For both the uniform sample and the stratified sample, 
ASU just performed resampling twice to guarantee query accuracy. Since there seems since a significant change of the data distribution happens only after these batches. For the four test queries, ASU basically achieves the same query accuracy as for the us. For Q3, the relative error of ASU is a little bit higher than that of four. Because some of the tuples in the result of Q3 are replaced by new tuples. Even so, the relative error is still within the user specified error bound. Here is the performance combination between 4 and ASU on the TP3 today's site. For both the uniform sample and the stratified sample, ASU has only value sampling on the first update point because of the dist distribution of the TPC HD site is uniform and it is rarely changes. For the four test queries, ASU achieves almost the same query accuracy as four dots. For Q3, the average relative error of ASU is smaller than that of four due to the sample randomness. Here, we show the effect of base data size on the performance. The experiment is performed on the weekday site. The base the data site we choose varies from 24 hours, 48 hours, 96 hours, and 168 hours. The average time cost of 4 increases significantly as the base data site increases since the sampling needs to scan the entire data site. We also find that the business size has a limited effect on the time cost of ASU because it can reduce the unnecessary sampling operations and update the sample incrementally. To evaluate the query accuracy, we take Q1 as an example. As shown in the figure, ASU achieves almost the same relative error as for on the different business sites. Here, we show the effect of bad data size on the performance. The experiment is also performed on the weekday side. The best day side, we choose varies from 1 hour, 6 hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours. For the average time cost of sample update, both for and ASU will be affected by the best day sides. However, the effect of best day sides on ASU is much less than that on four. <clears throat> For the query accuracy, ASU achieves almost the same relative error as for on the different base sites. Here, we compare the performance between ASU and the TSU on the wiki data site. For TSU, resampling just occurs only once. The other resampling operations are replaced by the adaptive runable sampling points. For the other update points, uh, such as 0 0.3, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. The time cost of TSU is less than that of ASU because the sample size of TSU is smaller than that of ASU. For the query accuracy, due to the degeneration of randomness, the relative error of the four test queries in TSU has a little increment. The relative uh, error of Q2 in TSU does not increase because all tuples counting triple W have been injected into the thread by sample. It is a rough subpopulation. Consequently, the result of Q2 will not be affected by the randomness of sampling. The increased relative error of Q1 and Q4 is larger than that of Q3 because the small subset is more susceptible to the reduction of randomness than the large subset. In summary, we can see that TSU can update the samples faster than ASU by sacrificing a little query accuracy. So, in this paper, we propose two adaptive sample update approaches, ASU and TSU. According to the influence of the new batch on the current samples, they make a choice between the resampling strategy and the increment update strategy to reduce the overall sample maintenance cost. And they are faster than the full resampling strategy in sample update speed, while achieving almost the same query accuracy as the full resampling does. In future work, we focus on eliminating the extensive resampling. We may try a predictive resampling method that makes use of a prediction of data distribution changes to prepare for sample size increases. 
That's all. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Han Bing. I should mention that Han Bing is a PhD student at uh, Fudan University, and he's working in the area of database systems, but also uh, recommender systems. So are there, are there any questions for Han Bing? Okay, yes. uh, Leo, Liu, um, why don't you unmute yourself and, and ask the question? Thanks for the speakers. I have a question. As we know, the online aggregation is also a sample-based approach such as the test. And you will sample the data set when the user query input. So does your approach help this kind of work? Uh, okay. Can you listen? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, for the other, uh, for the online aggregations, uh, we don't need to construct many different samples in the processing, uh, but we will store some samples when, it, uh, when executing the user's queries, uh, such as the tester. Uh, since these samples can help them execute the users more efficiently, so in this approach, uh, they also need to maintain samples when the data are updated, and uh, our approaches can help them. Okay. So um, I hope this answers the question. So Joe, uh, Joe Zhang, you also had a question? Oh, thanks for your work and yeah. uh, question. Why the sample size of TSU is smaller than that of ASU? Uh, okay. Uh, the sample size of TSU is smaller than that of ASU uh, because the sampling in ASU will make the sample meet a higher confidence level than the user specified confidence level. Uh, but the detailed readable sampling approach in TSU will make the sample meet the user specified uh, confidence level. Uh, so the sample constructed by the resampling will be larger than that constructed by the adaptive readable sampling point. Uh, so the set of TSU is smaller than that of ASU. Okay. Any final questions? Okay, so that's not the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute everybody so we can uh, give a round of applause uh, to all five speakers for, for this session. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, we'll try to do our best here, right? So, uh, so thank you all for attending this session. This was a, a the session about uh, data curation, data cleaning, uh, and analytics. And um, if you stick around, you'll you'll uh, listen to some talks about uh, spatial and temporal data. And um, otherwise, we'll see each other around at the conference. Uh, thanks for coming to this session. Thank you.